Welcome to Christ Life Ministries for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.12 A work of faith, a work of love, a work of perfection unto a glorious church. Thank you for your presence in our midst. We enter your word now. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand and ask the same presence go with us into the word. Come and open it up so that we will behold new and wondrous things out of thy law. In this context, anoint me afresh so I will speak indeed as I should as an oracle of God. Then put the same unction and anointing upon the ears and the hearts of everyone who will hear me, those who are physically present and those who will hear me remotely, electronically, so that the word will flow freely from you through me to the people to do an internal and eternal work in every heart, including my own. In particular, cause our wills to become more humble, minds to be more enlightened with revelation knowledge, emotions to be more tempered and controlled by the power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I further praise as I speak, the power of the Spirit of God be released in great and sufficient measure to back these words and follow them wherever they are heard and released in all the earth. Power that will heal, power that will deliver, power that will break yokes and free men so that they will become doers of what they hear and are hearers only. I also pray for mercy to be faithful that I will deliver the word with precision, redeeming the time, saying only what you want me to say, bringing out of the treasure of this word things new and old as a scribe instructed unto the kingdom in jesus wonderful name we pray and all in agreement receiving every blessing i mentioned in their individual lives agreed individually and said amen, amen. praise the lord this first sunday of the year i have a very important instructional message that i trust each and every one of us will allow to become, will allow to be the watchword for their operation in this new year of 2021. I said this on New Year's Eve, and I mentioned again earlier on this morning during the Bible study. 2020 was a year of shaking. It's never happened before in human history when all nations have been shaken. Individual nations have been shaken over the years, but not everybody at the same time. The coronavirus pandemic has shaken all nations, not only in terms of health, but also in terms of economy. So many economies have been shut down, schools have been shut down, and people are finding it difficult to recover. But the good news is that the scripture that tells us this reveals to us that God, the desire of all nations will come, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, and then God will fill this house, which is the church, with glory. So we expect that 2021 will be a year in which the desire of all nations will come and God will fill the church of Jesus Christ with glory that will now deliver creation from the bondage of the corruption of uh, COVID-19 and other plagues that will come as a consequence of man's sin. Man's collective and cumulative sin is the reason for the perilous, difficult things that are happening on the earth. You know, people don't understand that sin has a consequence. It's not just you, what you do. You know, uh, I've shared this over the years, you know. Uh, good example. Saul killed the priests of Nob because he felt that they helped David. And they didn't know anything. David just went there. 
you know, they, they did not know that there was anything wrong within David and Saul. David went there and he asked, you know, for the showbread and asked for his sword. He took Goliath's sword, you know, the sword which he himself had, had uh, taken from Goliath. But it was kept there in store. So he said, let me have that. Then he took the showbread and gave to the people who were around him. And the priests were innocent. They, they thought he was on the king's business. They didn't know that there was a um, tension between Saul and David. Anyway, Saul in his very, um, how shall I call it, his uh, impulsive manner. God do it on Gentile. And they went to kill the priests. Fast forward to many years later. Saul is dead. David has become king. He's been king for many years. Then there's a famine in the land. So David goes to inquire of the Lord. What is causing this famine? And God told him that it was what Saul did. When he killed the priests. But that had happened years earlier. In the same manner, many of the sins that people are committing, adultery, homosexuality, uh, abortion, murder, greed, covetousness, they have ripple effects on the environment. They have ripple effects, you know, and our physical bodies. Uh, I shared this when this coronavirus started. You know, God knowing what he's doing, because see, God is a good God. When he gives us laws, it's not to keep us in bondage. Rather, it's to set us free. He talked about eating unclean foods. And uh, we're told that this thing started in a place called Wuhan in, in China. And there's a market there where they eat and buy all kinds of food, you know, all kinds of bats and all kinds of things. And they eat them, you know, some almost raw. And I'm even being told, uh, we were watching it on CNN recently, I believe, Pastor Gene, you know, that they've gone into the Congo and they're saying the contagion to come. <laughs> You know, uh, but if you eat unclean food, those animals carry viruses. And when we ingest them and we eat them, those viruses enter the human body and then they are transmitted like this one, this coronavirus. So man's sins, you know, whether it's moral, you know, when God says, don't eat this, it's not because he doesn't want you to enjoy good food. The Bible says God has given us all things richly to enjoy. But if he says, don't eat this one, it's because he knows that it can contain a germ or it can contain uh, some virus that can hurt you. I remember as a kid, I was in Form 3. We were studying biology. I remember tapeworm. I remember tapeworm. And uh, it struck me then. That's why God said that you don't eat pork. Now, of course, it's not that it's wrong, you know, to eat pork at all. But if you're going to eat pork at all, you have to make sure that it's pork that's been properly looked after. You know why? Pigs are scavengers. They eat any rubbish. So they ingest that, then you eat it. Then you pick up the same thing. God's not stupid. Don't you never say God's not stupid. God is very wise. If he says don't eat unclean food, it's because he doesn't want you to catch a funny virus. <laughs> Give the Lord a clap offering. Don't want to catch it. But sadly and regrettably, most men don't pay attention to God. They go about doing what they like, you know. Oh, I like this food, you know. You know, I like this, you know, I like to eat this and I like to eat that. It tastes nice and all of that. Well, you might be eating what will kill you. Ultimately, it may not kill you today, but it puts something into your body that can, you know. So, it's very important 
for us as Christians generally and even as men generally so we've come to see now that the Bible has universal application it's not just for Christians for everybody you know if you obey it there's certain blessings that come with it you disobey it, there's certain consequences that come as a consequence of the uh, disobedience and so today as we go into 2021 I have an important message the Lord has given me and I've entitled it humility instruction and wickedness Hum- it was a humility instruction and wickedness you know when we often think of wickedness we think of somebody who goes to do something really wicked and bad which it includes that but many times disobedience to instruction is wickedness it translates to wickedness even though the person who didn't omitted the instruction or disregarded the instruction may not have had it in their hearts to be overtly wicked but that is the consequence and that is why, as we go into 2021, I want you to take these three things. Humility, and we're going to see the connection in a minute. Instruction, and the consequence of not doing them is actually wickedness. And I will explain as we go along. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is a very, very prophetic psalm. It actually prophesies about when God comes to the church in his glory and in his fullness. You know, I'm not going to get off into that, but it says, you know, in verse 3, God shall come and shall not keep silence. The fire shall devour above him. He will call to the heaven above and to the earth that he may judge people. God is coming to the church. Of course, he's here already, but what we mean by he's coming in manifestation, in the manifestation of his life and power and glory inside the church. And when he comes, he's going to come with judgment. Everybody wants the glory, which is good, but I must tell you the truth, it's a two-edged sword. It's going to, there's going to be glory on one hand, there's going to be judgment on the other. You know, because God is coming for a glorious church, not having spot, blemish, or wrinkle. So all the God's people who are not walking with God as they should, that coming will be like a fire. It says in Malachi chapter 3, it says the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, you know, and he will be like a refining fire, you know, and, and, and it's going to bring judgment to the church. You know Why? I've been in this thing for 40 years by the grace of the mercy of God. I'm talking about, you know, preaching about end time, perfection, and everything. I wrote my first article as a young boy in Imperial College. I was 21 years old, called The Hope of His Glory. You know, when I go and look at that article, it's on our website. I said, oh, man, did I write this 40 years ago? And indeed I did. It was the mercy and the grace of God. Now, Pastor Boyga will bear witness to this because we went around in the in the late 80s, the early 90s. There's nowhere we didn't go. All over Nigeria. And then later on, I also went abroad. And different People don't like to hear the truth. It was so simple. God's word is simple. The word is neither in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. What's difficult about that? But people are stubborn. They are rebellious. Again, you have to take God's definition of rebellion, not your own. When Saul did not obey God and he did his own version of what God said, God said, Go and kill all the Amalekites, destroy everything. He did, but he didn't do everything. He said he kept it. The Bible says, 
Rebellion is as witchcraft. Stubbornness is iniquity and all that. That's God's definition of rebellion. Not my own. Not your own. That's God's definition. The person who willfully rejects a part of God's instruction either because it's not convenient for them or they just don't feel like doing it then they take a part that they like then the one that they don't like they don't they don't the bible calls it rebellion all that God has to get rid of in the church that's why judgment is coming and you must understand that God is a God of loving kindness of justice and of righteousness you know God God loves his children he loves all of us he doesn't you know God will avoid he would rather avoid any unpleasantness but when people won't listen then he has no choice but to allow judgment to come in order to get man's attention there's a scripture that has been coming to me you know in recent times concerning these things is when thy judgments are in the earth then the inhabitants will learn righteousness now think about this how come they didn't learn righteousness before his judgments were in the earth it's Isaiah chapter 26 I believe it's verse 9 yeah with my soul of I desire thee in the night my spirit will seek thee early he's talking about getting up early in the morning to pray now, for when thy judgments are in the earth, then the inhabitants of the earth, how come majority of people will not learn righteousness until there's a judgment in the earth? I'll tell you the reason. It's the stubbornness of the sin nature that is inside man's mind, will, and emotions. You know, there are people like that. They just won't, no matter who, you show them the truth, tell them everything, they just will ignore you. The only time you will get their attention is when something drastic happens. When thy judgments are in the world, ah, then they will learn righteousness. Uh, this message I'm giving to you is a good message so that you can avoid it. I'm not preaching this so that judgment can come upon you. I'm preaching this so that you can avoid judgment coming on you. I didn't hear amen. I thought that was very encouraging. I will repeat it. I am not preaching this so judgment can come upon you. I am preaching this so that you can avoid judgment coming on you. I didn't hear it. God doesn't want to, you know, judge his people unnecessarily. If you will learn righteousness without judgment, it's better. If you will learn righteousness by instruction, but many people and born again Christians inclusive you know there's so much stubbornness and rebellion in the heart that until judgment comes they will not learn righteousness they will not obey instruction it's when their lives are in danger And it looks as if everything is going to perish. Then they now start taking God's word seriously. But usually by that time it's late. Even though they may be saved in the sense of that they will not go to hell, they will go to heaven. But they will suffer loss. Unnecessarily. That could have been avoided by simply accepting instruction by humility and thereby avoiding wickedness God loves his people he doesn't want to judge them but he does when they won't listen when they will be stubborn when they will be rebellious you know and I've given you the definition so rebellion is not just uh, somebody who drinks beer and somebody who you know fornicates and you know somebody who does you know some terrible moral sin that is is part of it but you know the particularly in the church rebellion is hidden it's hidden by stubbornness 
it's hidden by refusal to accept God's instructions and you know <clears throat> I will, I, yeah they said that but that's the way they think about it I'm not going to do that people do that all the time I've been a pastor now 30, we started in 84 so it's 36 years this year it was 37 2021 you know people can be very stubborn and if you notice on, on, on New Year's Eve, I kept saying, it's not Olupi's instruction. It's not Mommy Sarah's instruction. You know, get up early in the morning to pray. Is that my instruction? It's not my own. It's Jesus' instruction. And if you want to follow Jesus, you have to follow that. He said, I rise up a great while before the day. I prevent the dawning of the morning and cry for help. He said, yeah, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but I'm tired. I want to sleep. And you know, God, you know, God, you heard this before. God does not put us under bondage. So I mean, why should I have to get up early every morning? I mean, when I can, I do. When I can't, I, you know, I, I don't. You know, you know I'm, I'm going to be led by the Spirit. You're not being led by the Spirit. You're really being led by the flesh. Because that's the reason why the Lord Jesus made this statement. He says, straight and narrow. That's why it's straight. That's why it's narrow. Is the way that leads to life. And that's why few find it. And broad and wide or easy is the road that leads to destruction. And many there be that go there out. So many people. Now, Let's look at verse 16 and 17 of Psalm 50. Um, we're just going to read two verses, 16 and 17. But unto the wicked, God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Observe these wicked people were God's people. Because it's God's people that declare his statutes. It's God's people that put his covenant, his word in their mouth. He's not talking about sinners here. He's talking about Christians. They declare his statutes. They keep his covenant. But they are wicked. Why? Verse 17. Seeing Thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. I've been a pastor, like I said, 36, 37 years now. This thing is so common. Majority are like this. It's a sad commentary, but it's the truth. Majority are like this. They hate instruction. If you tell them anything, in fact, many of them are like, yes, sir, but they're not going to do it. They've already made up their mind they're not going to do it. Jesus gives a parable about them. He said they were, the man had two sons. He said, he said to the first one, he said, go and walk in my field. He said, I will go. And then he didn't do it. Then he said, he had, the second one said, I will not go. Then that one now repented and then went. Then Jesus now said, the um, prostitutes, and the tax collectors are entering the kingdom of God before you, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the ones who tell God, yes, I will, but they don't. The other guys are the guys who said they won't, then they change later. This 2021 and the decade that is going to unfold is going to be a decade of great glory. Like mommy said, pleasant surprises. But it is going to be for those who obey instruction. Uh, the rebellious and the stubborn are going to find a very hard time. Hence this message. The rebellious and the stubborn. He said, see you hate instruction and cast my word. You heard it, but you, you put it behind you. And I have 
something I wrote here. Before I re read that, uh, you know, God gave me, when I was preparing this yesterday, the Lord gave me a, an, uh, an example, you know, of disobedience to instruction and its dire consequences. It's wicked consequences. But before I give that example, let's go to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, the last verse is verse 33. It says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. The fear of God. See, if you have a fear for God, if you have a reverence for God, it will always motivate you to obey instruction. If you disobey instruction, you don't fear God. I don't care what you say with your mouth. Hello? I didn't write this. Solomon, the Holy Spirit through Solomon wrote it. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. The reason why <coughs> people disobey instruction is because they don't fear God. <coughs> they don't reverence God. Now I know <coughs> most people say, no, that's not God. You know, he's a man. But you've forgotten what Jesus said. He said that if you hear me, then you, you don't hear me, but you hear he that sent me. The issue of delegated authority. So, so if Pastor Olubi tells you something, or Kenneth Hagin tells you something, I know he's a man, but he's actually God speaking to you through him. If you fear God, you will obey that instruction. If you don't, obey the instructions because you don't fear God. And of course, you can always find an excuse to say, well, you know, no, 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 that's, that's Ken and Hagen, that's, that's what Ken Hagen felt, but that's not what, um, there's no way the Bible doesn't say, like I've used this example, which is the example I'm going to use now, but I'm going to contextualize it to Jesus and Peter. You know, there is nowhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, where it explicitly says, Get up early in the morning and pray one hour in tongues. It's not there. <laughs> it is not there, but it is there. It's not there, but it is there. It's not explicit. It's implicit. That's why it says here, hey, a little there, a little. It is only people who fear God. And who have honest hearts, who really want to do the word of God, that will accept those instructions. I've given you my own personal testimony, and I will repeat some of it here. I was a young Christian. I got born again and filled the Holy Spirit. I was in England. I was in postgraduate school. And somebody sent me a Kenneth Hagin tape. He had given... The year before this was 19 this was 197 late 1979 Karen Hagen had given this message earlier on in 1979 at the camp meeting I went for the camp meeting in 1980 but I didn't go for the one in 1979 I was still I was still in Egypt <laughs> you know and uh, well I had gotten born again but kind of half backslidden so I didn't even know who Karen Hagen was at that time anyway so and I, I can never forget it. He was talking under unction. I played it because it was a tape. You know, we don't have tape anymore. We have now. What do we have now? There's a, there's a name we call it now. You know, podcast or whatever. whatever. But it's the same thing. Anyway. It's just different technology. You know. And you know what? Brother Hagin said, he said, in these last days, if you want to go far with God, if you want to go, make sure you pray at least one hour in the spirit every day. That's all I heard. He didn't even give me scripture. But because see, my heart was honest, 
and I, he said, if any man will do his will, then will he know. I was willing to do the will of God. So I was not, watch this. I was not looking for an excuse not to do it. I was looking for grace to do it. Many people, when they hear an instruction from the man of God, they are always looking for an excuse to be able to explain away what the man said so that they can wriggle out of doing it because deep down they don't want to do it. If any man will do his will, then will he know. Many of us are not willing to do the will of God. So any excuse we find not to do it, we quickly take it. And you know what? The word of God allows that. He doesn't approve of it. He said, here a little, there a little. Line up on line, precept upon precept. That's why people can, you can always find an excuse to justify whatever it is you want to do. So, Ken Hagen says, the Holy Spirit through Ken Hagen says, in this end time, if you want to go, to, he said, and he did, that, that one hour was not the minimum. He said, at least. I, I never forgotten it. And you know what? I just believed it and started practicing it. Now, let me tell you something. It wasn't easy. My flesh didn't want to pray. Don't forget, I was a kid. I was only 21 years old. No, I was in London. London is not where you pray in the spirit. Amen. It's true. You know? There were so many distractions. I had all kinds of friends. I had people, you know, I'd become a Christian, but I still had, you know, a lot of distractions. There were girls. There were all kinds of things. There, was, there were so many things that could have distracted me if I wanted them to. I could always find an excuse. To find, you know, oh, I can't do this. Oh, I have to do this. You know, and, and, and initially it was like that. But God had mercy on me because the heart was honest. And I wanted to actually do the will of God, you know. So I, I though it was not easy, I started practicing. I remember it was in the winter. This was, you know, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit November 11, 1979. So I started practicing these things. Later in November, early in December, it was winter. I cannot forget it. And I remember when I started praying in spirit like that, my head would start paining me. Every reason to give it up. And, you know, because it was the winter, it was cold, so I had an extra heater in my room, which I bought, you know, electric, you plug it. But when you plug it in, it gives you a headache. I still remember, ah! So I said, so I will turn the heater down so that I won't have the headache. Then I will feel cold. So I try to now balance it in such a way that, you know, the heater will be on, but it will not be too hot so that I could pray. I'm telling you what I actually went through. And, and I'll pray, pray, pray. You know, I remember when I first started doing it. You know, I'll pray. I was almost, I've done one hour. I look at my watch. I've done 10 minutes. And I said to myself, I said, this can hate you, man. Where did he get all this thing from? Yeah, people must be crazy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking naturally. I can't get anybody, you know. Uh, then I've had 15 minutes. But that's how it was. It was difficult at first. You know why? The flesh never wants to pray. When I say the flesh now, the sin nature inside the flesh. So I had every excuse to have given it up. The people around me were not doing it. The church I was going to was not practicing it. Though they were good people. Late Pastor Porter and uh, Mrs. Porter have gone home to be with the Lord. They were good people. But people, the, 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 the Christians around me, my friends, they were, nobody was, I was the only one. So, and they told me, you know, the, you know what people said. They said, well, yeah, yeah. You know, but you really don't have to pray one hour. You know, you can just pray a little bit in tongues. That's okay. You know, don't take things to an extreme. Have you heard that before? But I knew it was an instruction from God. And that my destiny was tied to obedience to that instruction. I didn't understand all that I know now, but I just knew it. So I was not going to allow any excuse 
So I would stay on, you know, I would pray, pray. Many times, I'm being honest with you, uh, I will sleep. I'll be so tired, I'll just sleep. But when I sleep, I'll just say, Lord, have mercy, forgive me, you know, then I'll start again. I now look back and I saw how pleased God was with me. He knew I had fleshly faults and that it was not easy for me. But he showed the willingness. And you know what happened? He gave me mercy, then I got better. I went from 15 to 20 minutes to an hour. There was even a day I prayed for six hours. <laughs> I learned that from Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin said, you know, when he wanted the move of God in 1940s, he prayed for six hours. So I said, Lord, I'm going to do that. I never forgot. I, I, it was, I think it was a Wednesday, if I remember rightly. They, we have the same thing in UI. Because UI came from University College London. And Wednesday is usually the day for sports. You know, so usually, you know, there, there are no lectures. I, you know, so I, I said, today, 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 we will do that six hours. And I started, uh, I think I said around 11 o'clock or something. In the, I did it too. My tongue was dry. My head was paining me. You know, I didn't enjoy it at all. But I did it. Because I was trying to follow, mimic, copy the example of the man of God. You know, God helped me. Once I got through that, praying in the spirit was not difficult again. Of course, I didn't pray six hours every day. But I pray an hour, I pray two hours, you know. And that's how I grew fast spiritually. My spiritual capacity increased, you know. My knowledge in so many areas increased. Why have I given you this testimony? I've given it to you because many people disobey instruction simply because when they first start obeying the instruction, they find it very difficult to do. So they, they now go and look for somebody who will agree with them and say, ah, you know, you know that our crazy pastor Olubi, they won't say that in front of me, but they say behind me, hello, hello, the Holy Ghost has got your number. The Bible says, you know, don't curse the king. He said, a little bird will go and tell the matter. Yeah, some, there are some people they call this, ah, crazy pastor. He said, ah, I'm not down low. What do you want to eat in church? Yeah. You know, that's how they always, you know, extreme shiny. <laughs> Hello. God knows your heart. So, you know, they, 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 they heard, or rather, you know, they say we should. Do. So once they, they, they find it, then they'll go and look for somebody who maybe either doesn't come to this church or is a member of this church who is like them. And Satan knows how to bring them together. You will notice he will not go to somebody who will tell him, ah, you have to do that. He always goes to somebody who will sympathize with them. Hello? And I say, ah, you know, I too, I was thinking like that. You know, this is extreme. Let's just manage, you know. We don't have to pray in tongues, dear. That's okay. That's okay. Hello? After all, the Bible doesn't say we should pray in tongues for one hour. And it doesn't. The best it says is, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? I'm going to come to that in a minute. You know, uh, and, you know, you should watch and pray always. And they went, Peter and John went to the, uh, to the temple at the hour of prayer. But even then, it doesn't say one hour. You should. All those are inferences. We infer them from the scripture. Are you listening to me? So, you can always find, you will always find somebody who will sympathize with you. And who will agree with you. Because you are not willing to do the will of God anyway. You're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're not willing. You, you're already looking for an excuse not to do it. So you will find those who will sympathize with you, you know, and be in agreement with you. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't think it was, you know, I, you know, I've told you my testimony, you know, the same time when I was in England, this before I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
and the whole the fellowship was split into two. You know, it was a Christian union. You know, the whole thing was evangelical. Half had a Pentecostal leaning. The remaining half didn't. So there was a debate about tongues. And this was the debate. These were the points. Yes, there is tongues. Nobody denied that. He said, but the Bible says, do all speak in tongues. Then the Bible also says, I actually heard this. This is true. But God's, the honesty of my heart and the integrity of my heart was what delivered me. He says, Paul said, I would that you all speak in tongues. But the, 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 and in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fellowship, this is what the argument, they said, it's Paul's opinion. He said, it's, God, it's Paul's preference for us to pray in tongues, but we cannot say it is God's commandment. And you know what? If you look at the letter, it's correct. But we know that it was the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. Then the same Paul now said, I thank my God, I speak in tongues more than you all. Now, you can always argue and say, well, you know, that's for Paul. He was an apostle, I'm not an apostle. And that's Paul's opinion. I would. He didn't say, God said all of you should speak in tongues. And he didn't say so. Paul just said, I would that you all speak in tongues. Now, you can, all those I, 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 I'm, I'm deliberately saying what I'm saying so that we can get all these traps and avoid them. You will always find a reason or an excuse not to do, uh, obey an instruction from God. You can always look for an intellectual argument. But it was the integrity of my heart that saved me. I asked myself, honest questions. I said, why would God say, I would that you all speak in tongues, and then I'll be one of those who will not? I said, I'm going to speak in tongues. Then Paul said, I thank my God. Ah, it means that he must have been benefiting from it. So what Paul was benefiting, I too want to benefit. That's just honesty. What saved me? Honesty of my heart. Not the intellectual arguments of the people in the fellowship. Now let's get back to this issue of instruction. And how it translates, when we don't do it, it translates to wickedness. The Lord gave me this. You know, the Lord Jesus at Gethsemane, in the garden, he gave Peter, James and John... All of them really. He, he divided into three groups. He was one. Then there was three of them, Peter, James, and John. Then there was the eight of them, of course, apart from Judas, who had gone to betray him. <laughs> so he now said, my soul is extremely sorrowful even unto death. He said, tarry here while I go a prayer yonder and watch with me. In other words, watch doesn't mean came out with me. It means pray. <laughs> You know we can be so silly. We can be so silly. You know. And as a dishonest heart can take that. And say, say, you watch. This is you pray. This is you watch. Ah, may God deliver us from dishonesty of heart. That's a great prayer. I know he was talking about prayer. Say, so watch with me. You know. Voila. So he comes back an hour later and he finds them sleeping. He's very disappointed. He said, what, Peter? Could you not watch me one hour? He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. <coughs> Excuse me. Watch and pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Lest you enter into temptation. So he goes to pray, comes back, same thing. Then three times, three hours. Then he now says, okay, it's all right now. Stand up, stand up. The person who's going to betray me is at hand. Then Judas comes to the people. But the point I want to make is this. 
that instruction was a very, very important instruction for Peter and John and James to pray because a temptation was coming. You know what happened? The guards from the high priest, they came with all kinds of weapons. Swords and knives and all kinds of things. And when Peter saw that they were about to um, arrest the Lord Jesus Christ, he reacted in the flesh, which was a consequence of his not praying, and drew his sword to cut off the head of that guy. He is not such a he is not such a skillful marksman that he could he could just you know just take the air off alone. He wasn't aiming for the air, he was aiming for the head. It was an angel that deflected the thing and got the air. You know what would have happened? There would have been a bloodbath. If he had hit that guy, the other people would have rushed them. Do you understand? They would have kept Jesus, but they would have killed all the other guys. And three years' work would have gone down the drain. But before you start shouting, hey, ah, ah, you know why? Lack of obedience to instruction. You can now see why disobedience to instruction is wickedness. It would have cost the lives of the 12 apostles. A simple disobedience to the instruction to pray when it was critical. Thank God they didn't pray but Jesus did. It was Jesus' intercession that saved the day. And what did Jesus do? He not only did he pray for an angel to avert the disaster that Peter was going to cause, but there was spiritual power to give instant healing. The Bible says once the guy's hair was cut off, Jesus took the air and pushed and plastered it back instantly. Give the Lord a clap offering. When the guards saw that the Lord Jesus had healed that man, they backed down. They knew there was not going to be a fight. Then Jesus said, you want me? Take me. But let these ones, let them go. And they let them go. I use that because uh, the Lord gave it to me. As an example of the wickedness that is a consequence of disobedience to instruction. When you disobey instruction, the consequence is some terrible wickedness. I have used this illustration over the years. A pilot is flying a 747. They've taken them out of the skies now. I'm going to miss a 747. Yeah, it's a great plane. But, you know, they've got some new ones now. There's the A380 and others. Great, great planes. They call it the queen of the skies. It's been around for many years. From the 70s. 747. But they, they, they're pulling them out of service now. You know, he's flying into Lagos from London. He's in Niger Republic. Now that looks far, but it's not far. If you're in a 747 and you're doing 700 miles an hour, then Lagos is less than 45 minutes an hour. So, as they're over the Niger Republic airspace, a clarion call comes from the watchtower in Lagos. Flight X, Y, Z, you know, this is Lagos Control Tower. We have an unusual situation. There is a sandstorm that has risen over Kano, you know, as you enter the northern Nigerian airspace. 
go two degrees east and climb 5,000 feet to avoid it. The pilot has flown that route 100 times. He knows it by heart. They've never had such an instruction. And because of pride, he said, don't mind that. You know, you know these boys, you know these boys in, in Lagos, maybe it's just one of them just having some, some, you know, I've flown this, there's, there's no such thing. So, he does not move two degrees east and he doesn't climb 5,000. So they go across Niger Republic and enter into the Nigerian, northern Nigerian airspace and lo and behold, he goes smack inside the sandstorm which affects his engine, affects something and the plane crashes. 300 people die. Did the pilot want to kill 300 people? No. But his disobedience to instruction led to the wickedness of 300 people dying. Spiritually, that happens all the time. God will say, do this! Now, you know, there's so many things God can't tell you. Why? Your mind is limited. Yeah, how long is it going to take God to explain to you? To, he, if he has to explain to all of us the reason why he tells us to do things, he will never, get, he will never finish explaining. All God wants from you is inst- in, in obedience. Move two degrees east. Climb 5,000. And that will solve the problem. When you land on the ground in Lagos, you will understand why. But this is not the time to argue. So, disobedience to instruction, the consequence of it is wickedness. Like I give the example of Gethsemane, and I give this hypothetical example of a pilot who is flying such a sophisticated machine. 747 of these big jets, they're moving at over 700 miles an hour. If they tell you to do something now and you wait five minutes, it's too late. Because of the speed with which the plane is moving. When you're given an instruction from the watchtower, you have to do it now. Because in five minutes time, you would have entered where you should not enter. Spiritually, it's the same thing. Pray. Get up in the morning. Do this. Ah, no, I'll do my own. I'll do it next week. Next week may be too late. Some damage may have been done before next week that you may never be able to recover from. Doesn't mean you won't go to heaven, but there are just some things you may just lose. And that is why it is so critical to obey instruction. Now, let me talk a little bit about instruction. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Am I helping anybody here? Over the years, I, the Holy Spirit gave me these definitions. Knowledge answers the question, what? Understanding answers the question, why? Wisdom answers the question, how? Instruction is what I call the how of the how. That's detailed, it's detailed wisdom. Here the Bible tells us, take fast hold of instruction. I didn't hear you. Let her not go. Keep her, for she, turn to neighbor and say, she who? She instruction is thy life. Why are Christians being destroyed? Why are Christians dying prematurely? Why are Christians all kinds of disasters happening? Because they don't hold fast to instruction. The Bible says, she is your life. She is your life. 
take fast hold of instruction, for she is your life. You don't take fast hold of her, it can make you lose your life. I didn't hear amen. You, you, you know, Pastor G, this is a problem I have with the church. When you preach truth like this, nobody wants to agree with you. And it has nothing to do with Olubi Johnson or agree with me. It's the Bible. I'll tell you something. I'm about to burst a bubble. You say amen, you don't say amen. It will not change the truth. <laughs> Pastor Wigger <Kuyga> said amen. <laughs> I'm going to repeat it. You say amen, you don't say amen. It will not change the truth. The earlier you agree with truth, the better it is going to be for you. Simply not saying anything when they tell you truth that you don't like will not change the truth. Now, we can to close. I'm going to give you two scriptures. How now do we obey instruction and thereby avoid wickedness? Well, the Bible has already told us humility. That's why we pray that prayer every day. I choose to fear God, so I humble myself by something to the will of God when I don't feel like it, you know, especially in prayer. Knowing the certainty of his judgment and chastening if I disobey and the security of his mercy when I obey. So I have more of the humility of the mind of Christ. Observe. It is not God who makes you humble. It is you who humble yourself. Now, when you do it, God will now give you more humility. But God is not going to force humility on you if you don't want because it's a question of your choice. I will say, I choose to fear God. I didn't hear you. So I humble myself. Turn to your neighbor and observe it is you who humbles yourself. It is not God who does that. Because humility... It's an act of your will. And God will not violate your free will. Give the Lord a clap offering. I. It is something you decide to do daily. Don't you, and of course you can repeat it like a parrot. And it doesn't have any meaning. Just say. Blah, 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 and it has no meaning in the heart. But if you say it from the heart. It will have an effect on your heart every day. Amen. So you should be more humble in 2021 than you were during the watch night service. There should have been an increase in your humility today than it was last week. So turn to your neighbor and say, 2021 is going to be a year of more humility and therefore more, more obedience to instruction and therefore less wickedness. Give a lot of clap offering. There's a lot of wickedness that's taking place simply because of disobedience to instruction. Now, so there are two things really that you need in order to obey instruction. I said this while I was sharing my testimony. You know, one of the reasons why people don't obey instruction is when they find it difficult or when it's not easy, on, particularly on the flesh. So by the time they do it two or three times, if it doesn't work, they feel under condemnation. And because they feel under condemnation, they say, I don't want to hear that anymore. I'm not going to that church anymore. Now, today, there's a lot of alternatives. There's so many places you can go. You don't, you don't need to listen to this kind of message again. Go on YouTube. You'll find plenty of things that will agree with what you want to have. You know, but it will not change the word of God. It will not change the word of God. So it is easy to avoid hearing the truth. But it will not change the truth. We can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. It won't change it. Whether they preached in your church or not does not change the Bible. The truth will always be there. Are you listening to me? So, what do you need so as not to be under condemnation when you hear instruction and you start practicing it and then you're not doing it very well? You try it, you don't do it well. You try it, you don't do it well. 
you tried, you don't do it well. After some time, you say, ah, this thing it can't really be so. I've tried it, you know, I've done it three or four times. It doesn't work. Then you have not read your Bible properly. And that's why I gave you my own personal testimony. When I first started praying in the Spirit, I can't tell you how many times I failed. I'm talking about 50, 100, so many times. Sometimes I would sleep. Sometimes, you know, I would, I would not pray properly. I will be tired. My head would be aching me. But I didn't give up. Why? Because the Bible says this. It says, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Observe he, he puts mercy at the bottom. By, not by your own effort alone, but by the mercies of God. What does mercy do? Mercy gives you the blood. It gives you life. It gives you, so that when you fail, ah, thank you. It's a beautiful illustration the Holy Spirit has just given me. I've actually had it in my heart for months, but I've not said it in church. Today, it's come. How many people know when somebody, uh, we don't have that too much in Nigeria, but you know, if you go to a circus, we don't have too much of that in Nigeria. You know, then they tie a rope and then the man is trying to balance walking on the rope. Usually there is a tarpaulin at the bottom so that if he falls, he will not die. It will catch him. That's the mercy of God. Walking with God is a tight rope, straight and narrow. But you have underneath the everlasting arms. You have the mercy of God. So you should not be afraid of practicing instruction. Because whenever you fail in the instruction, the mercy of God will catch you and it will bring you back to where you stopped. And you're going to get better and better and better and better and better. Is this clear? That's why you need the mercy of God. The mercy of God will catch you. It will preserve you. Look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Proverbs 24, verse 16. I like this. For a just man, observe the man is just. His failures does not stop him from being just. Give the Lord a clap offering. A just man falleth seven times. Seven is just symbolic. You know, in using the example of Jesus in the New Testament, you can put it 70 times seven. Riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Say, a just man, a guy who wants to do the will of God. He says he may fail while he's trying to do it. But whenever he fails, he will rise again. What makes him rise again? The mercy of God. The mercy of God will cause him to rise again. So you don't have to be afraid when you hear instruction that looks a little bit difficult and that you may find difficult to do initially. Don't worry. The mercy of God will see you through. If you have to do it 70 times, 7 times, you will do it and you will get it. You can ask me. There are a lot of things I'm doing now. If you look at me in the natural, that's the natural Lulubi Johnson, and some of my infirmities, you think it's impossible for me to ever be what I am today. To be a pastor, to be. I had so many weaknesses. I had so many infirmities. But God help me. God will help you. God will help you. So when you're going to practice instruction, have it do it by the mercies of God. When you fail, just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Have mercy. Help me. Give me wisdom. How do I do it better? You know? I was encouraging uh, 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 young people to pray. And I was telling them what I used to do as a young Christian. When I said all this praying in the Spirit, you know, uh, praying uh, three times, four times every day, binding the devil. I learned all those things by practice. I saw them in the Word of God. You know, uh, David said, Even, ev evening, morning, and noon will I pr pray. Then the Bible says, Daniel prayed three times a day. Then uh, Deuteronomy says, you know, when you're sleeping, when you get up, when you walk by the way, when you sit in the house, you know, four times a day. It wasn't easy, you know, initially. 
now it's easy his yoke is easy his burden is light because i have grace and mercy in sufficient measure but when i first started you know i would fail now this is one of the things that god helped me with i said ah you know god you see that i want to do the will so please have mercy help me and he would you know so gradually i'm talking gradually <laughs> Those who are close to me know this. I have a lot of records in my in the church office. I started keeping a prayer diary in 1981. You know why? To record my failures. I didn't want to fool myself that I was doing something that I was not doing. So I had a check. I, it was self-accountability. And initially, I must be honest with you, when I first started, I used to get something like 2 over 10. <laughs> then, over the months, it moved to 4. Then it moved to 6. Then it moved to 8. Then I now saw, ah, this thing is not as hard as they made it seem to be. Then I now understood that it's the grace and the mercy of God. So, don't condemn yourself when you fail. Be honest about it and say, Lord, have mercy and help me. Teach. You, you even have it much easier because you have pioneers by the grace and mercy of God like myself and others who've gone ahead of you and we've, show, we've shown you how to do it. It's not difficult. I found that the Bible is true. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. The Bible is actually true. His yoke is actually easy. The problem is that we've tried to do a lot of these things in the flesh instead of doing it by the Spirit. But now we know we use the blood, we use the word, and we use the spirit. You will find that it is easy to do these things. Practice, practice. Initially, you won't do it very well. It doesn't matter. You know, what God is looking for, I've got to close. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. God is not asking for immediate perfection. That would be unjust. He is asking for immediate perfection. Decision and practice. With time, the practice will get better. Is this clear? What God does not like is rebellion, which is no decision. I've heard that, but I'm not going to do that. No. no. Make the decision. I'm going to do what God says. Once decision is made, then start practicing it. The practice, it will take time for the practice to get better and better and better. And every time... The practice fails. Just ask for mercy. It will help you. And with time, you'll get. Because in this 2021, and this decade that is coming, you're going to need obedience to instruction. It's going to be the key. Take fast hold of instruction. For she is thy life. Let's talk to God.